Hey, I'm Steve, also known as Terramantis, and this is my channel Vitcha. In this video, I'm joined by friend and fellow YouTuber Dave Klein. Tell everybody what we're going to be working on today, Dave. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at 10 things that inspired the crazy and twisted world of Bloodborne. From manga to anime and film to novels, we're going to cover some of the most interesting and cool inspirations that went into making the world of Yharnam come alive. And from the looks of us, I'm sure you can tell that we've been playing way too much Bloodborne, but that also means that we're ready to talk about it. So remember to hit the like button if you learned something new, and if you already knew everything, don't feel bad for one second to also hit the like button. Alright Dave, let's get started. Blech. What better way to start off the list than with a classic? In an interview with 4Gamer, Bloodborne game director Hidetaka Miyazaki discussed the gothic horror atmosphere of the game and how it came about. Miyazaki states that he wanted to convey a similar atmosphere to Bram Stoker's Dracula. This is made clear as day in the earlier sections of the game and the use of the Victorian setting in the streets of Yharnam themselves, which ooze with a similar gothic atmosphere to that of Dracula. Not only this, but certain themes also seem to be present within the game. Blood transfusion is of major importance in Bloodborne. In the very first moments of the game, your character receives a mysterious transfusion that places you right into the nightmare, surrounding you with burning beasts and strangely sickly creatures crawling over your body. In Dracula, blood transfusion is also important, as transferring blood is the only way to save Dracula's victim, Lucy, a very important character to the narrative. Blood is also a common theme in both, as Dracula drinks the blood of men and beasts in Bloodborne lust for blood. Not only this, but there's also a Dracula vibe in Kanehurst, where the vile bloods seem to resemble vampires in their search for blood, as that is their entire purpose. That's right, in Bloodborne, Annalise is the Queen of Kanehurst Castle and ruler of the Vilebloods, a sect of the Healing Church that broke away from the religious establishment to pursue their own agendas. And, as almost every item mentioning Annalise states, the Queen wishes to one day bear the Child of Blood. To attain this goal, Annalise has spread disciples across the world in search of blood dregs. She then consumes this blood of murdered hunters. Indulge thyself in our tainted blood. Additionally, the text accompanying the Queen in the guide refers to Annalise as a vampiric aristocrat born of forbidden blood. And finally, even when Queen Annalise is reduced to a disemboweled heap of flesh, she can still be restored to life at a special altar, essentially suggesting she's immortal. Bloodlust, vampirism, aristocracy, immortality, murder, these are all very important elements to Queen Annalise's character. And interestingly, many of these same aspects can be found in real-world history surrounding the notorious Bathory family, particularly Countess Elizabeth Bathory. Elizabeth was labeled by Guinness World Records as the most prolific female serial killer in history. It's thought between the years of 1585 and 1610, the Countess murdered over 650 people. And why did she do this? Well, like Queen Annalise, Elizabeth sought to consume herself in the blood of her victims. Not only that, but she did this as a misguided means to maintain her youth and chase immortality. The Bathory family history, and specifically Elizabeth's murderous, bloodlusting reputation, is often cited as one of the first examples which likely gave birth to the mythos surrounding vampires and their blood-hungry thirst. Speaking of vampires and their origins, Miyazaki and his team traveled to both Romania and the Czech Republic in order to explore and conduct research on all of the old villages. Romania being the supposed origin of Dracula was the perfect location. Miyazaki told Kotaku UK, Almost everything in Bloodborne originally comes from things in real life. In order to create the kind of real feelings we're looking for, we looked to actual architecture. In Romania, we went to the town that was the model for the Dracula story. This town possibly being the town of Sigisora in Romania, where Vlad the Impaler was born and later became the basis for the fictional legendary vampire Dracula. It's likely Miyazaki and team also explored Bran Castle, which is also commonly known as Dracula's Castle. Despite there being no evidence Bram Stoker knew anything about the castle, as he actually based Dracula's castle off of Mount Isavarul Kalmanalui. For those of you who don't know, similar to the way a virus or disease that's contracted through the air is referred to as airborne, this is the exact same meaning for the word bloodborne. It's a disease that's contracted through blood or bodily fluids. 
Now syphilis is a bloodborne disease, but what you may not know is that in the Victorian age, similar to the era bloodborne is inspired by, syphilis was a disease that ran rampant. Historically, the disease was also known as the Great Pox, and the latter extremely serious symptoms of syphilis, when untreated, could cause aggressive deformities, blindness, and even madness. Now if this sounds like I'm describing the townspeople of Yarnum, it's because I very well could be. Also, interestingly, to treat syphilis in times before penicillin, alchemists and doctors would prescribe Quicksilver as treatment. Now, Quicksilver is more commonly known today as mercury, which is also known as being highly toxic. And ironically, Quicksilver can cause the exact same symptoms as syphilis with blindness and insanity after extended use. So in other words, just think of yourself as a doctor of your arm dolling out Quicksilver prescriptions. <laughs> Most fans of the Soul series know game director Hidetaka Miyazaki is largely influenced by the manga Berserk. In fact, Steve and I discussed in the previous video how Guts, the main protagonist of Berserk, has striking similarities to Artorias of Dark Souls. Well, now with Bloodborne, the connections go even deeper. For example, in Berserk, Guts garnishes the brand of sacrifice on his neck, which marks him and connects him to a nightmarish alternate dark world. In Bloodborne, hunters are connected to the Hunter's Mark, the mark acting as a way to bring them back to the Hunter's dream. So not only does the branding mark of Berserk and the Hunter's icon of Bloodborne resemble one another, but they both act as an intermediate between worlds as well. And while certain themes connect between the games and manga, it goes further. The messengers of Bloodborne seem to be pulled straight from the pages of Berserk, resembling the dark spirits who come for Griffith in his time of need. Sweet. Not only this, but the hybrid human great one Ariana gives birth to in Bloodborne looks exactly like the hybrid human hand of God Casca gives birth to in Berserk. Finally, if you've ever wondered what inspired the Executioner's weapon of choice, the Ligarius' wheel, once again look no further than Berserk. While Ligarius' wheel is used by the religious extremists of Bloodborne, wheels are used as a means of torture by the religious extremists in Berserk as well. One church member in particular uses a wheel as his weapon, just like Alfred the Zeal out of Bloodborne. Well Dave, this strange weaponized wheel actually goes even deeper than solely connecting to Berserk and Bloodborne. Historically, an iron or giant wooden wheel was used as a device of torture or capital punishment in times of antiquity. This form of execution was known as the breaking wheel. Traditionally, the condemned was often bound to the wheel with their limbs placed in between the spokes. This arrangement made it easier for appendages to be broken when struck by maces and large hammers. Additionally, an account from Franz Schmidt, a public executioner, he goes on to say that the breaking wheel was actually used as a weapon to delve out punishment during a man sentenced to death for committing patricide. The connection between the breaking wheel being used as a method of execution and Alfred of Bloodborne's use of the wheel to smite Annalise only seems fitting. On top of that, Alfred's covenant is labeled the Executioners, and he dons a mask concealing his face when dolling out punishment, similar to the Executioners of Antiquity in the Breaking Wheel. The Moonlight Sword has a history of appearing in From Software games. The blade has made an appearance in everything from the company's very first foray into video games, King's Field, to the mech sim Armored Core. The sword has gone on to appear in all three of the Souls games, yet seem oddly absent from Bloodborne. But with a bit of sleuthing, there is a possible connection. Now bear with me, this is a loose connection, so I'll leave it to you to decide if you think it's actually a reference. At first glance, the blades aren't overly similar in appearance to one another beyond the relative shape and embroidery on the blades. This is mostly due to Ludwig's lack of the Moonlight Blade's signature teal hue, but when enchanted with the power of the moon through the empty phantasm shell, it begins to take on some of its former luster. Additionally, the Ludwig's Holy Blade scales with Arcane, which is similar to the Moonlight Sword's intelligence-based scaling. While this isn't much to go on, the largest potential connection from Ludwig's Holy Blade to the Moonlight Sword rests in the name itself. You see, there's another famous Ludwig, one who happened to compose the Moonlight Sonata. That's right, I'm talking about Ludwig von Beethoven. I realize it's not a 100% connection, but hey, you never know. Honestly, this sounds exactly like the type of obscure connection Miyazaki would go for. As a matter of fact, it wouldn't be the first time he's used a composer to influence aspects of the game. Ornstein from Dark Souls, as an example, seems to be named after the composer Leo Ornstein, especially as he drops a Leo ring upon defeat and is fashioned after a lion.
Brotherhood of the Wolf takes place in 18th century France, and if showing you the box art wasn't enough to already convince you that it had a part in the inspiration of Bloodborne, let me tell you a bit about the story itself. In Bloodborne, as indicated by the clothing your character first starts with, you're a foreigner to the land of Yarnum. In Brotherhood, similar to Bloodborne, two investigators are sent to the foreign land of Javondon in search of a mysterious beast killing hundreds. Additionally, like the lore of Bloodborne, there are hidden themes of beastly rituals and politics between feuding factions, one of lawful good and the other of occult origin. Also, there's wordplay similar to Bloodborne as well in Brotherhood, with characters achieving enlightenment only to be followed by madness. Sardis works for himself. Enlightenment has driven him mad. And finally, if the picture-perfect attire of the Brotherhood of the Wolf characters wasn't enough, there's even weaponry that seems to be pulled straight from a list of Bloodborne's trick weapons, particularly the threaded cane. In Brotherhood of the Wolf, there's a weapon that can transform from a sword into a lethal chain whip and back again right in the midst of an attack. <laughs> The contact gesture in Bloodborne is important in not only becoming Bloodborne's version of the Praise the Sun gesture, but also in being a staple of the choir in their attempts to make contact with the Great Ones of the Cosmos. But why the strange gesture in order to make contact with these Great Ones? Well, one famous proposal for making contact with extraterrestrials comes from Gauss's right triangle proposal. This suggests that the best method for signaling to ETs is to create a giant right triangle, in the fashion of the Pythagorean Theorem, in order to showcase the intelligence of the human race and our understanding in mathematics. So what does this have to do with Bloodborne? Well, if you observe the make contact gesture, what you're essentially doing is making a giant right triangle using your arms. I mean, sure, maybe you look like an absolute lunatic doing it, but at least the brain of Mensis still likes me. It gave me a moon rune! Alright, the last topic is on the Eldritch Master of Horror himself, H.P. Lovecraft. Now don't get us wrong, we definitely think Bloodborne's ties to Lovecraft mythos is fairly well known. Yeah, from the great Cthulhu-like amygdalas and squid-faced brain suckers, it's pretty common knowledge that Lovecraftian lore and mythology has worked its way into Bloodborne. But we're willing to bet that's about all you know. That, yeah, that's a Lovecraft connection. Exactly. So we're going to delve into some details connecting both the eldritch horror of Lovecraft and the nightmare world of Yarnum. It should go without saying though that Lovecraft's library of work is extensive, meaning we could talk about this single topic for hours probably. Instead, Dave and I have chosen two of the strongest and most interesting connections between Lovecraft and Bloodborne. Dreams and nightmares are of the utmost importance in Bloodborne. They're the source of most of the problems residing in Yarnum, with the School of Mensis using a nightmare to beckon the Blood Moon, which is turning the Yarnumites into beasts, and the Hunter's Dream being your primary respite of the game. Well, you'll find that dreams and nightmares are crucial to the tales of Lovecraft, and beyond the Wall of Sleep, as an example, through dreams, the ordinary man, Joe Slater, is connected to the cosmos and gods, where a cosmic being is using him as a vessel. In the Lovecraftian tale Celify, Karane searches for a certain city within his dreams, and when he finally finds the city and reigns over it in the dreaming world, it turns out his body's actually perished within the real world. However, you're left to wonder which world was actual reality. This scenario is very similar to Mikolash of Bloodborne, the man in the Nightmare of Mensis who's seeking to transcend humanity. While Mikolash's consciousness is very much awake and alive in the Nightmare of Mensis, his physical form in the waking world has long since been mummified. In Lovecraft, often the story is narrated by a sole survivor of an encounter with strange, otherworldly cosmic beings of reality, dreams, and space. During these encounters, the narrator is usually rendered an unreliable witness due to being driven to suicidal tendencies or complete madness from the events. This is very similar to Bloodborne. The madman's armor set and madman's knowledge consumable item implies just being exposed to the wisdom of these elder cosmic creatures will drive the human mind insane, some even going so far as to take on characteristics of these bizarre creatures. Gaining insight will in fact cause your character to see things that aren't normally visible. In a way, like Lovecraft, insight works as an insanity meter of sorts. Additionally, whenever you encounter a boss, just witnessing the creature will add points of insight, pushing you ever so slightly closer to madness, just like the misfortunate narrators so traditionally found in Lovecraft literature. But, but that being said, I think we should probably stop here from the looks of you. 
We've unknowingly already witnessed all the human mind can handle, and I'm afraid the eldritch truth may have taken hold of your mind as well. Alright guys, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. I also hope you'll go check out Dave's channel. I couldn't have made this video without him, and it's important to support YouTube content creators. I highly suggest his super show. It's pretty awesome. Alright, I'll see you in the next one. The reason this armor is significant though is because it's the iconic fluted armor of Demon Souls. Not only that, but its positioning is posed almost identical to Demon Souls box art. There's no need to drag me by the arm like some kidnapper. Whatever, Marl! And stop it! Well, what you may not know is that the Souls franchise has an overarching theme of life being cyclical and time repeating itself over and over across eons. I believe this to be true of Destiny as well. See beyond our mind's eye that there is a way, a potential for humans to evolve beyond their natural limitations.